Happy Friday, everyone, and welcome to yet another episode of WatchGuard Security Week in Review, a video podcast dedicated to quickly summarizing the biggest information and network security stories each week. As always, I'm your host and security nerd, Corey Nockreiner, and this is the episode for the week starting January 28, 2013. This week actually included a number of interesting security stories, but for time's sake, I'll only concentrate on three of them. That said, I'll post details about some other stories in the reference section of the blog post associated with this video. Let's start with the news about Yahoo Mail account compromises. This story has actually been brewing since the beginning of January. Basically, earlier in the month, an attacker found a cross-site scripting vulnerability on Yahoo's website, and he released a YouTube video showing how he could leverage that vulnerability to steal some account credentials. Now, Yahoo said they fixed that vulnerability shortly after it came out. However, later in the month, security organizations like Offensive Security, and most recently this week, Bitdefender, uh, claim that there's still cross-site scripting vulnerabilities in Yahoo Pages, which attackers are leveraging to steal credentials. Most recently, Bitdefender said there is a flaw in one of Yahoo's developer pages, and that was what the uh, attackers were leveraging to steal account credentials. Now, the good news is, in order for this exploit to work, the attacker has to send you some sort of email or instant message that contains a specially crafted uh, hyperlink. And you'd have to click on that link and fall for some, some user interaction in order for him to actually steal your credentials. So as long as you're careful not to click any sort of specially crafted links, you're probably safe from this. Nonetheless, if you're a Yahoo Mail user, you might want to pay attention to your account to see if there's any unusual activity on it. In much bigger news, HD Moore, who's the creator of Metasploit and also the CSO of Rapid7, released research on his five-month security research project outlining some of the vulnerabilities in the Universal Plug and Play protocol. Now, if you haven't heard of Universal Plug and Play, this is a, a group of networking protocols that allow uh, devices to seamlessly discover each other on a network and to start communicating and sharing data. It was originally intended to help consumers uh, create products that could quickly network and find each other on home networks. So it's mostly a consumer-oriented protocol. Anyways, over the past five months, Moore and his team have been scanning the IPv4 address space on the internet, looking for devices that respond to universal plug-and-play queries. And what they found greatly surprised them. Essentially, they found 81 million or over 81 million devices that actually responded publicly to their universal plug-and-play queries. That's about 2.2% of the internet, so a ton of devices. Furthermore, they found that the majority of these devices used four different universal plug-and-play software development frameworks. And many of these software development frameworks contained a ton of security vulnerabilities. In particular, one of the software frameworks suffered from a very critical uh, remote code execution flaw. Basically, if you can send a single, uh, even spoofed UDP packet to a universal plug-and-play device, you could leverage this flaw to remotely execute code, potentially gaining control of the device. And uh, Moore found that 23 million devices suffered from this particular vulnerability. So essentially, the research not only proves how exposed these universal plug-and-play devices are on the public network, but that a lot of them are actually running some legacy uh, development software that haven't been updated and suffer from many, many vulnerabilities. So what should you do about this particular set of universal plug-and-play vulnerabilities? Well, the sad news is they affect thousands of devices from thousands of different vendors. So they're quite extensive and pervasive. Now, the good news is if you're a business user, chances are you're not exposed to these flaws. Most business routers and business class network gear do not enable universal plug and play. In fact, firewalls like WatchGuard's XTM appliances block UDP uh, port 1900 by default. So we aren't exposing these services to the internet as a business. 
That said, I still recommend businesses scan their internal network looking for any uh, universal plug-and-play devices, which you probably have. Things like printers often have universal plug-and-play services enabled. That way you have the option of disabling universal plug-and-play internally to at least avoid internal attacks leveraging these sorts of vulnerabilities. Now for the consumers out there, you actually have a lot more work ahead of you because many, many consumer devices do enable universal plug and play by default. In fact, many of the consumer routers, including ones your ISP may have provided you, may have universal plug and play even enabled on the WAN or external interface of the router. So as a consumer, the first thing you need to do is check your, your gateway router or your internet router and make sure you do not have universal plug and play enabled externally. On top of that, consumers should also scan their network for universal plug and play uh, devices. The good news is Rapid7 has released a free tool, I believe they call it Scan Now UPnP, and this tool can scan your network and tell you what devices have universal plug and play enabled. Now if you're using universal plug and play, you may want to keep it enabled. If that's the case, you might want to check with your vendor to make sure you're running the latest software so that it's not vulnerable to uh, any of the common security vulnerabilities more found in his research. However, if you're not using universal plug and play, the moral of this entire story is disable it. If you don't use it, turn it off because it can be very, very dangerous. Unfortunately, uh, ease of use and convenience, which is something universal plug and play supplies, doesn't play very well with security. In fact, usually convenience means insecurity in many cases. So again, the moral of the story, if you're not using universal so plug and play, turn it off. Finally, the biggest news this week came out late Wednesday or Thursday morning, and this was a story about New York Times alleging that they were hacked by Chinese-based hackers for the past four or five months. Essentially, the New York Times released a story talking about their research into a network breach. They hired a company called Mandiant, and what they found was they had been extensively breached. Many of the devices on their network had many different variants of malware on them. Uh, the Mandiant organization tried to track down uh, where this malware was coming from, and they did track it down to some uh, universities in the United States, but those universities were victims themselves and, and seemed to be proxies proxy servers for attackers which Mandiant alleges comes from China. In any case, the New York Times, when they found this breach four months ago, they didn't uh, clean it up immediately. In fact, they actually allowed the attackers to stay on their network to allow the security researchers and the forensic teams to continue trying to see where the attack was coming from and what exactly was being stolen. In the end, it turned out the attackers gained the credentials of many of the journalists. So in any case, this of course made big news. Everyone's talking about this latest so-called China-based uh, New York Times hack. In fact, right after New York Times made this allegation, the Wall Street Journal posted its own story talking about how they also were breached by what they believe are Chinese-based attackers. These stories seem to continue to confirm that nation states are increasingly getting involved in the cyber espionage and cyber attacks, which I don't think is a good thing. Frankly, some of the uh, advanced techniques that these nation states seem to be using in their attacks and malware will surely continue to trickle down to criminal malware that affects all businesses. On top of that, these attacks show that advanced persistent uh, attack campaigns can sometimes get past legacy defenses. If you want to protect yourself from the more advanced and persistent attackers out there, you definitely need defense in depth. No one security control or solution, like a basic firewall or basic AV, is going to prevent every single attack on your, your network or organization. Rather, you need many different layers of security in order to protect you from the many different blended threats out there, which, by the way, is exactly what WatchGuard provides in our XTM security appliance. So if you're a business or consumer out there that, that wants to protect yourself, definitely think about layered security and defense in depth. So that's it for this week's security news summary. It certainly was an action-packed week from a security industry perspective, and I hope you learned something and enjoyed the show. As always, for more regular security news, check out both our WatchGuard Security Center blog and watch us on Twitter. I'm at SecAdept, and WatchGuard is at WatchGuard Tech. As always, thank you for watching, and here at WatchGuard, we're rooting for you.